like language translation, we recommend using the Microsoft translation app on your smartphone. And I think Jared is going to show a, um, a slide. Well, we'll show that one first. That's just keep it there. Um, if you'd like to use closed captioning and you haven't used Teams before, there's three dots. You click on the three dots and turn on closed captioning. OK, the next one, Jared, if you would like language translation, we re recommend Microsoft translation app on your smartphone and you turn on the microphone. Thank you. OK, our parent resource series is a joint venture between the Bellevue School District and the special needs PTA. Our next session is supporting the understanding of IEPs. We're going to have that on Tuesday, March 23rd at six o'clock also information will be coming out to every parent with an IEP. Um, now I'd like to introduce Lisa Ritchie. Lisa, can you turn? There you are. She, Lisa is the Bellevue School District Special Needs PTA President. Uh, or I'm a board member. <laughs> or something like that. Well, I mean, we all work together, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd like to just make sure everyone knows about our group. We're a district-wide PTA that supports families with kids with um, on a 504 or IEP. And our next general men membership meeting is April 21st at 630. Um, I'm going to put the link to our website in the chat. And if you go there, um, you know, a few days before the meeting, we'll put the link so you could join our uh, meeting. And anyone is invited. You don't have to be a member, um, although we'd like uh, people to join, but you don't need to join to go to our meetings. Um, I think that's it, yeah. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, another thing, if you have questions, um, we're gonna monitor the chat. We're also going to have a question and answer time at the end. Um, ask brief sort of general questions. Please don't provide any personal information in the chat or your questions. So let's begin tonight's presentation. We have quite a treat for you this evening. Two exceptionally talented advocates for children, Dr. Jared Taylor and psychologist Lane Barker. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself a little bit first, um, then Lane can speak for herself. Um, I am a former psychologist in the district. I've been uh, working as a behavior intervention specialist for many years, and my current role is coordinator of behavioral intervention uh, supports and mental health services. And Lane and I work together on our mental health assistance team. She's one of our star members of the team. And um, I will uh, probably say a couple things after Lane introduces herself as well. Go Hi, for it, everyone. Lane. My name is Lane Barker. I'm a school psychologist in Bellevue. I've been in the district about, I don't know, nine years or ish now. Um, I, and I'm currently serving as a member of the mental health assistance team at Bellevue High School. Happy to be with you tonight. We'll explain a little bit in the video what, what uh, mental health assistance team is. Um, First of all, I'm excited to be here. I, I love talking about this topic um, and it's really I'm a, it's a passion for me. Uh, mental health is a passion and I think uh, it sounds like Lane would probably say the same thing. And um, what I wanted to say is that the, I'm, the, the video tonight is about an hour and 13 minutes and we decided to pre-record um, most of the content. And the reason why I did that um, is that I wanted to get through a lot of information and some of that information may be overwhelming. Um, I hope it doesn't pr provoke too much anxiety for you. Uh, we do have um, handouts and I don't know if those are going to be given during the session or after um, the PDF. Um, we do have a handout around that. Um, this video will be posted for you to kind of look at later. And again, um, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Um, I don't expect everybody to get every aspect of this. Um, it's it's a lot of content. It really is. Um, and it's hard for us as kind of uh, instructors in this to be able to figure out what where to focus. And so we try to throw a lot of different things in there. And, you know, what I do think we do and Lane does a really good job of this is that when we are have concepts that we really want you to take away, we do highlight those concepts and I'll probably point some of those out at the end of the video as well um, because it's really um, there's a lot of information but you know there 
you know, take what you can get out of it and we can kind of go from there. Do you have any additional thoughts or comments, Lane? No, sounds good. Um, I think I can also kind of highlight some things in the chat as we go too. You know, I can kind of throw some like, remember this or check this out in the chat as we go. So keep your eyes on the chat too. Um, as uh, you know, parents, keep your eyes on the chat and I'll throw some things in there. Okay, well, I'm going to share my screen here and make sure I include the computer sound because that always trips me up when I don't. There's another one of my happy places. There's a little, this is Loch Ness. There's a little Nessie right there. You can see her just barely poking her head out. Anyway, so here's a presentation. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to Bellevue School District's community forum for on mental health and sports. Uh, my name is Jared Taylor. I'm coordinator of behavior interventions and mental health services. And uh, later joining us will be Lane Barker, who's a uh, mental health assistance team counselor. And we're here to present tonight um, some strategies to how to support your worried or anxious student. Before we jump into the main content today, I want to go over what we're going to cover. Uh, first of all, uh, the four main topics are we're going to define anxiety and stress, what it is. We'll talk about the prevalence of how often it occurs and when it becomes a, a challenge. We'll talk about some of the causes, and then we'll talk about some strategies that you can do at home to help your child, and as well as what the school can do in the community. Um, I do like to spread a little bit of humor through my my presentations, especially for such challenging and difficult topics. Um, I think sometimes humor can be a helpful uh, cure or kind of respite for anxiety and depression. So I try to do that as much as possible. So obviously you've got to get there with social anxiety trying to blend in. So why are we talking about anxiety? Well, um, obviously <laughs> with current situations, I think people are feeling a lot of anxiety. And when it becomes uh, a problem or a challenge, um, students with anxiety often show more behavioral and academic challenges in schools. Um, they tend to be suspended from schools more frequently, um, although we're not using suspension um, significantly in our district anymore. Um, it's still, still the case uh, that students do miss a lot of school. Uh, and again, they refuse to attend or will drop out of school. Um, this can lead to lots of challenges in adulthood uh, with ranging from employment difficulties to problems with relationships. In extreme cases, um, addiction uh, issues, possible incarceration and suicide. Unfortunately, anxiety is one of the more common emotional problems in children. Um, the overall rates uh, tend to be about 20% of all children. So one in five um, kids are having some sort of mental health issue. A lot of that is anxiety, although other disorders are very common as well, um, and often uh, disorders that co-occur, uh, such as anxiety and depression or ADHD and anxiety are also very common. Unfortunately, um, a lot of our adults also experience that, a little less than 20%, 18.5% also experience that. And what we've found locally in our district is that when we've given the a survey called the BIMAS-2, um, we've seen anywhere from 35 to 55% of students um, have reported significant or elevated levels of anxiety or depression. So considerably higher in the local samples. Of course, some of those are kind of false positives um, and are probably less than that, but it's still quite high, uh, even at the lowest number. Um, it's highly likely that during our, given our current situations uh, and COVID-19 restrictions that the anxiety is actually higher than even that. A um, lot of factors that we consider in this, um, that systemic racism, uh, community violence, uh, not being able to see other kids, all of those things are probably increasing the rates. In order to make sure that we're kind of keeping common language, I'm going to provide some definitions for you. Uh, first, we'll start off with stress, then worry, then anxiety, and kind of talk about the stress cycle. Let's start off with the concept of stress. Uh, stress is a perception um, that we're unable to cope with the demands of the situation at hand. This means that something is coming at you and you don't feel like you can handle it, essentially. And so it's a physiologic res um, uh, response, often caused by a specific trigger, uh, to kind of a perceived threat. 
And I think it's really important to note that it is a perception um, and the fact that we are unable to cope with that. Worry, in contrast, is a process, cognitive process, that uh, where people focus um, their thoughts on the object of the anxiety or stress. It's often very specific. And there are times when, when worry uh, and actually stress can be very helpful as well uh, for situations where preparing for situations where, th where things could go wrong or to make sure that we are doing the things that we need to do. The problem is that stress and worry can kind of grow too big and become more problematic. Our next term is anxiety, which just like stress is a physiologic body response uh, to a perceived threat. However, um, the perceptions of the body response maintains after the imminent threat is gone. Um, it's often a kind of a persistent or, or it involves excessive worries. It's obviously a long term response to stress. Um, the feelings, um, even though the threat is not there, there still can be intense feelings of fear, nervousness, and tenseness. Sometimes the, the anxiety can be diffuse as well. It's kind of hard to put into words. There's a general worry about something that bad is going to happen. Um, certainly anxiety and stress are normal and helpful at times, but we're going to talk about when it, when it uh, becomes more challenging in a, in a few more slides. This slide talks about the stress cycle, and this is kind of a normal escalation cycle that people experience with anxiety or anger and aggression as well. We're also talking a little bit about fight, flight, or freeze, and I'll, I'll tell more about that um, when we talk about the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in a later slide. But uh, I'll start off with the stress cycle here, and we'll talk about baseline. And this is hopefully where most of you are right now. You're uh, sitting kind of watching this video kind of calmly, hopefully. Your, your blood pressure is down, is normal. It's your heart rate is kind of in the average range. Your breathing is normal and you're able to think and process information quite well. Unfortunately, sometimes something happens and we kind of go into the alarm phase. It's usually triggered by a perceived threat or some sort of um, uh, environmental stimulus that's, that's uh, well, threat inducing. And so we'll go into the alarm phase. And in the alarm phase, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, our uh, breathing becomes much more shallow and um, uh, stochotic. And our ability to think rationally and reasonably um, goes down as well. Our narrow, our focus becomes much more narrow and we have more challenge with, with figuring out how to solve problems in our world. Um, that, areas where we go into fight, flight, or freeze. And fight and flight um, are two kind of things of animals, if they perceive a threat, they're either likely to fight uh, the threat or to run away from it. There's another one where people kind of, animals will play dead, essentially, that's kind of the freeze. And so you'll see people sometimes kind of get, almost go catatonic in that situation. After every kind of alarm phase, there has to be, it's usually a big expenditure of energy and so there has to be some sort of recouping of that energy, and that's called the exhaustion phase. And in that situation, people are sleepy, they're tired, they might be still irritable, but they need to kind of retreat from whatever it is and be kind of in a quiet, alone area as well. This slide is probably one of the most important slides of the presentation tonight, um, because it really kind of gets at what anxiety is and how it becomes a problem. And the analogy that we like to use is the anxiety monster. Uh, and we've got some pictures here from Stranger Things. We've got the Demogorgon and the Mind Flayer, the Shadow Monster there. Uh, those are great examples of, of good monsters that are kind of amorphous and abstract. Um, the thing about anxiety is that it's fed by fear. And so the monster grows in power by the more fearful we are of it. And what happens is avoidance and escape tend to make it bigger and worse. From a behaviorist perspective, anytime that you are reducing anxiety makes it more likelihood, it's kind of a negative reinforcement. And what happens is that you're trying to, anytime you see an anxiety situation before, you go back to what you know and what has worked in the past. And so, by running away from the anxiety, it just kind of continues that anxiety. 
And really the only way to tame the anxiety monster is to stand up to it and to do what's called sensitization, where the monster in and of itself does not cause any kind of a physiological response. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, the kind of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, but I think this is the most important thing that I, if I could teach parents and, um, and kids is that by running away from the anxiety, it makes it worse, which is really easier said than done, I recognize. But there are ways that we can kind of help with that. When looking at anxiety, it's helpful to have a kind of a conceptual framework or a model uh, to explain anxiety and to others and to understand it uh, more, more fully. And uh, the model I have here is called the cognitive behavioral model of anxiety. It also works for uh, depression and other mental health issues as well. But what you'll notice here on the left here is what's called the co cognitive triangle. And that's composed of thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. And um, obviously thoughts are the, the things that are going through your mind and the obsessions and worries. Behaviors are the specific behaviors such as arguing or crying or yelling or running away, all those things. The feelings um, would be a uh, feeling of dread, uh, uh, tense muscles, uh, sense of, of extreme fear, almost like a panic disorder. Those are kind of the feelings that go with it. What you'll notice there is that there are tri or arrows uh, going back and forth between the different um, concepts. And the idea is that each of these concepts kind of affect each other. So your thoughts can affect behaviors and feelings and kind of all the way around the, the triangle as well. Um, to give you an example of how that occurs, um, let's take uh, current conditions of being at home and doing online schooling. You may have some students who refuse to engage in going to class um, or showing up to cameras, on cameras in particular. And it might be that the thoughts are, they, I didn't do my homework and my teacher is gonna call me out in class and I'm gonna be extremely embarrassed. Uh, those are the thoughts. The behaviors would be either turning off the camera, logging in and then doing something else or not even logging in at all. Obviously the feelings um, would be if the student is presented with that situation and forced to do that, the feelings would be, um, you know, increased heart rate, uh, high blood pressure, uh, probably some sweating, um, all of those things would occur. Now, there's two other parts of this that are really important is there's the cognitive distortions and reinforcement. The cognitive distortions are the unhelpful thoughts or kind of thinking errors that uh, lead to the behaviors and the feelings as well. So in the example that I showed is that, you know, everybody's going to look at me or think I'm weird. The teacher's going to call me out or I'm going to be embarrassed because I didn't do my homework. Those are cognitive distortions. Student, a teacher may be angry or frustrated, but usually they're not. Um, and so they're unhelpful thoughts. In general. Uh, it may have, they may, that student may have had experience in the past where that unfortunately occurred. But in most situations, teachers are going to be very helpful and wanting to help the, um, the student in that situation. And what happens uh, with reinforcement is that when a student thinks that, they engage in certain behaviors that help to kind of tamp down those feelings. And that works for them. Uh, it, what happens is, is that the behaviors that occur um, reduce the feelings. And so whenever those thoughts come up or the situation is presented, those behaviors and those thoughts have been reinforced because they uh, reduce the feelings. It's kind of, uh, uh, in behaviorist terms, it's kind of negative reinforcement. You're removing a, an aversive situation and that's likely to create that behavior to happen in the future. Let's delve into the more uh, biological aspects of anxiety, which could be part of the feelings part um, of the cognitive triangle. Um, there's two parts to the nervous system, our nervous system. There's the sympathetic and then the parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system kind of causes the physiological arousal, uh, which is responsible for fight, flight, or freeze. Um, the opposite of that is the parasympathetic, which kind of count, counters the sympathetic nervous system. And so um, anytime that we, you know, go into a fight or flight or freeze or freeze or some sort of anxiety situation, it can take a little while for the parasympathetic nervous system to get it kick in. 
but eventually it will. That's important that we, uh, when we look at different types of treatments, the parasympath we're trying to engage the parasympathetic nervous system as quickly as possible. So in the cognitive behavioral model, I gave you some uh, kind of feeling sensa sensations related to uh, anxiety. Here are some more specific ones. Uh, this is a pretty good list um, of that. Uh, things that I didn't mention is uh, nausea, uh, trouble concentrating, jumpiness, uh, dizzy, faint, lightheaded, things like that. This slide explains a little bit more about the thoughts that I mentioned earlier. Um, specific thoughts that uh, thinking that danger is everywhere or thinking that a single situation is very dangerous when it actually is not. Um, there's often a, a, a concept of a, a faulty smoke alarm that detects smoke when there's not. That's often when an anxiety disorder occurs is that our thoughts are not necessarily accurate to the situation. Um, other people can also worry too much. That can be a, a symptom of anxiety. And other people see thoughts uh, or have thoughts and images of bad things happening. And they tend to be irrational or kind of unhelpful. So this slide goes deeper into the behaviors um, that we that kids often show or people often show when with anxiety. Um, a real common one is avoiding situations. Um, younger kids will tend to, or even uh, older people will tend to cling to safe people or refusing to leave them. Um, you might get temper tantrums or outbursts from kids um, when, when feared with uh, or faced with separation or the feared uh, situation. Sometimes people involve rituals, uh, particularly in a, a disorder called um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, you may also see aggression, particularly if their escape um, avenues are, are blocked. Uh, you may get aggression. And you might also get oppositional behaviors where kids will refuse to do something because it causes them anxiety to go there. This slide is really important um, as well because this lists um, some of the behaviors that you might see at home uh, related to more significant anxiety uh, concerns. So um, situations like isolating or arguing, uh, avoiding people, places, situations, um, headaches, or stomach aches, uh, those are called somatic complaints, those are very common. Um, a common one that I work with is also refusing to go to school or to engage in Zoom, uh, excuse me, Teams meetings. We don't use Zoom. Uh, but difficulties with transitions. Uh, another one that I'm also seeing is excessive electronic device use. That also goes with gaming as well. Uh, difficulties with going to bed, uh, maybe going to bed and taking you know, an hour or two to, to get to bed. Um, other things that uh, just being very quiet, um, avoiding social situations, and fatigue. In the school setting, these are behaviors that we see that are often indicators of more significant behavior or anxiety uh, problems. So school refusal, kind of avoiding to go to school or skipping classes, uh, yelling and shouting at others, uh, inappropriate language towards classmates, physical aggression, uh, refusal to complete assigned work, non-compliance, um, a lot of these things, reassurance seeking, all of those. What you'll notice is a lot of these behaviors are kind of externalized in the sense of that they're acting out towards others. And the tendency might be to say that child is being annoying or irritating or a problem, when in reality, um, they're actually probably experiencing anxiety. And maybe the only way they know how to deal with it is by kind of pushing people away. Previous two slides showed kind of some more significant issues with anxiety. It's really hard to determine when it's really a problem and when, when you need to get help. And really the idea is that when it becomes a pattern and it starts to negatively affect a person's life. And when we consider um, what areas of life for kids, it's usually around academic and vocational functioning, kind of social functioning, physical health, and then play and leisure time. If a student is having lots of problems in these areas, then it's probably time to get help. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, behavior is on a spectrum and anxiety is on a spectrum. And so it really, you know, some people may have a high level of anxiety, but it isn't really affecting maybe their academic or social functioning. Um, and so they may not need that level of, of help. Um, it's really kind of independent. And, and oftentimes it's, it's, if it starts to affect people's ability to get get their work done or to have a kind of a high quality of life, then it's time to get additional help. When you go to get help, um, doctors will often 
provide diagnoses. And these are the most common kind of, of anxiety types or diagnoses that we see in kids. Essentially, sorry, it's paused or something. I think there was a, a gap in the, the video there. Looks like it'll pick up here in just a second. There we go. I'm going to go over the next few slides briefly uh, just to give you a sense of what types of anxiety disorders are out there. Um, it's some of the most common uh, forms in kids. So I'm not going to go over every aspect of the slide, but just show you briefly what's there. Um, the first and one of the more common uh, forms of anxiety is generalized anxiety disorder. And it's essentially a persistent and excessive worry about a variety of different topics. It's sometimes an kind of unspecified sense of anxiety as well as specific worry about, uh, about topics. Uh, it's very difficult to control the worry. And there are kind of feelings associated with that, such as restlessness, being easily fatigued, difficult sleep, concentration, concentrating irritability, things like that. The next disorder that's common is uh, panic disorder. And panic disorder can occur with other disorders such as uh, specific phobia or uh, generalized anxiety disorder as well. But panic disorder is an intense episode of, of fear that uh, triggers severe physical reactions. Um, and oftentimes people feel like they're having a heart attack or Dying, it often involves significant sweating, shortness of breath, feeling of choking, feeling of significant discomfort, things like that. So it can be very distressing for people who are in a panic disorder. This next disorder gets a lot of press, partly because there's a lot of different types of specific phobias and uh, strange names, uh, but it is specific phobia. And it is a fear of events, people, or objects. And it's very detailed, and unlike generalized anxiety, where it's kind of uh, amorphous or kind of uh, uh, unspecific anxiety. This is around a specific event. So like the spider there uh, chasing the, the uh, laser, wanted to give you something icky and funny at the same time to reduce the anxiety there. Um, you know, there is specific arachnophobia. Um, apparently, there's fear of cows, so a picture of cows. But um, this is what we commonly see around phobias. And it does happen in school. There are certain kids um, who will display phobias around uh, certain aspects of school. Another very common anxiety disorder is social anxiety disorder. Uh, this is where people are very afraid to be in social settings. Uh, could be one person or it could be a, a group, anything like that. And in that situation, the person feels noticed, observed, or judged. Situation. Uh, they fear social rejection significantly, and that social interaction will kind of constantly cause distress. And so, because of that distress, people try to avoid that distress so they don't engage with other people. What you see in classrooms, these are the, the shy, very, very shy kids, extremely shy kids, almost painfully shy kids. Um, and oftentimes, teachers don't notice them because they are quiet and oftentimes well behaved because they don't want to stand out as well. Uh, these are the kids that are often silently suffering, and um, we are trying to do things in our work, uh, particularly at, at, through the mental health assistance team, which we'll talk about later, uh, to identify these kids. Another anxiety disorder that gets a lot of popular press is um, OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. And this is where people experience thoughts uh, that are constant urges or impulses that are unwanted. So I'm worried that uh, my mom is going to die or my child is going to die. And in order to, they have some sort of ritual that they perform to prevent that from happening. So it might be that if I uh, recite the numbers, uh, the prime numbers up to a certain number of numbers, <laughs> it might be that that will stave off the, the threat to my significant loved one or something like that. There's a variety of different OCD um, symptoms ranging from reciting numbers to checking to symmetry, all of these types of things. And uh, for people with OCD, they often recognize that the uh, obsessions and the behaviors are illogical or irrational, but they can't stop. And so it's a very insidious um, disorder. It's very, can be very painful as well. We do see some of this in schools. Um, uh, 
it's not as significant as some of the social anxiety, but it does occur. The last of the common anxiety disorders that I'm going to talk about is post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Um, this is a very common uh, occurrence, unfortunately, for students in our schools. Uh, for those of you who have heard of the adverse childhood events, it's similar to that, or the ACEs. This is where um, a lot of the study that was done, where a lot of, of people have experienced significant traumas in their life. And a lot of people do experience trauma, but don't have significant reactions to it or uh, long-term lasting consequences from it. PTSD is where that does occur, where there's significant uh, life disruption that occurs. Um, this includes, some of these disruptions include nightmares, flashbacks, sleep disturbance, uh, suicide ideation, and significant avoidance of uh, trauma-related uh, triggers as well. Uh, sometimes students in the classroom, um, when they become aggressive, it's actually related to uh, PTSD. They may have a significant panic attack, go into fight or flight around a trauma cue uh, or situation that reminds them of their trauma. And, but more often than it's, it's avoidance. Um, and this is something that we see a lot in schools and we're becoming more cognizant about it and doing a lot more instruction with teachers to recognize signs of trauma uh, related disorders. So let's jump into what causes anxiety. Uh, there's different reasons why it occurs, um, but there's four main areas, and I'll touch on each of those. So there's genetics, brain chemistry, and neurology, life situations and trauma, and then kind of learned behaviors. One theory of, of causation for problematic anxiety is that it could be genetic. Um, there's been some research done with twin studies on social anxiety disorder that showed a specific genetic link, uh, link, excuse me, and what, what happens is the twins are raised in different households and they tend to have the same identical level of anxieties indicating that there's some causal uh, factors there. These genes um, tend to affect uh, a chemical called neurotransmitters, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Another theory about how anxiety occurs is kind of through brain chemistry and neurology. And in this theory, there's problems with uh, the biochemical pathways in the brain. And I won't go into too much detail about this because it's, it's quite complex, but essentially there's a chemical called neurotransmitter, which helps uh, propagate the electrical signals between uh, synapses. And what happens is that in, in these areas, the neurotransmitters, um, there's either too much of them or too little and it can cause either misfiring or not, or firing too much of the, um, uh, the neurons, and that can cause problems. Another uh, factor along with this is kind of temperament, and temperament is kind of inborn characteristics of, of people. And what you'll notice is that with, if you've had kids or multiple kids, you'll notice that some kids have very different personalities when they're, after they're born. And these are often related to genetic factors, um, and the ones that are you know, the list there shows the different types of factors that have been identified in terms of temperament. But the ones that are really kind of important in anxiety is the approach and withdrawal, uh, whether somebody is willing to approach a novel situation or a person or withdraw immediately from that. There's some, some inborn characteristics about that. Adaptability, how well somebody is able to adjust to novel situation. The intensity of the reaction. So do people kind of respond in a mild mannered approach or have a large blow up? And then overall mood is affected by that as well. The next theory about how anxiety comes about is kind of trauma, relates to trauma and environmental causes. Um, there was a study a number of years ago uh, done on adverse childhood events. Um, They're also called ACEs. And these are situations that have affected people, um, things such as the death of a parent, uh, substance abuse in the house, uh, witnessing a traumatic event, things like that. And what they found is that um, these situations have an, a long lasting impact on how people um, react in the world. Um, it also can lead to um, disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And then lastly, um, on this page, um, brain trauma. Uh, so any uh, CTE, which is kind of uh, a newer diagnosis, 
with head trauma, um, any tumors or lesions can also cause an increase in anxiety. The last causal theory that we're going to talk about is uh, the reinforcement um, approach. Um, in this approach, I talked a little bit about it with the cognitive triangle, is that consequences, either positive or negative, affect the future behavior. So if a student is engaging in a behavior um, that escapes uh, from the anxiety, such as that student walking in the hall, kind of going running back into the classroom and saying, I'm not going out there, what happens is that that doesn't cause the anxiety to go down. And with what I showed with the anxiety posture analogy, it just kind of continues to feed it. And that's a, a problem. Um, I really want to highlight this. It's one of the more important slides. I think this one and, and the anxiety monster are probably the two most important slides. Jared, I think you got muted. It's important for parents to do we want to not be able to adjust to novel traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Can I go back here. And then lastly, um, in this page, um, brain trauma. Um, so any you know, sure. CTE, which is kind of okay. a, a newer diagnosis with Thank head you. trauma. Um, any tumors or lesions can also cause an increase in anxiety. The last causal theory that we're going to talk about is uh, the reinforcement um, approach. Um, in this approach, I talked a little bit about it with the cognitive triangle, is that consequences, either positive or negative, affect the future behavior. So if a student is engaging in a behavior um, that escapes uh, from the anxiety, such as that student walking in the hall, kind of going running back into the classroom and saying, I'm not going out there. What happens is that that doesn't cause the anxiety to go down. And with what I showed with the anxiety monster analogy, it just kind of continues to feed it. And that's a, a problem. Um, I really want to highlight this um, as one of the more important slides. I think this one and, and the anxiety monster are probably the two most important slides is that um, Kids who show the anxiety may show very irrational thoughts and behaviors and really challenging behaviors, arguing, screaming, crying, um, maybe even fighting. Um, but it's all because they're terrified and don't want to engage in the behavior that is expected of them um, if it's anxiety related. Sometimes it's not, but if it is anxiety related. And it's important for parents to not allow the student to give in that anxiety monster because if they do it's important uh, what will happen is that that will reinforce that in the future now that's easier said than done and uh, you want to do it with love and kind kindness and compassion and sometimes it's really hard to do because sometimes you don't feel that way when when it's um, when you're stressed out yourself as well um, i'm going to pass it off to lane and she's going to help show uh, or show you how to help in those situations and give you some ideas and suggestions to not give in to the anxiety monster and also do it in a way that kind of maintains uh, respect and dignity for your student. Hi everyone, my name is Lane Barker and I'm a school psychologist and member of the mental health assistance team. And now that Jared has talked a lot about what is anxiety and its causes, we want to move into discussing what are ways we can help. We're going to talk about some general ideas um, and focus mostly today on what you can do to support your child with anxiety in the home. We're going to talk a little bit more about what the school district is doing to support students experiencing anxiety, as well as community supports and services that are available. General therapeutic approaches that are included in most effective therapies include education, providing your child with information about what is anxiety and how it might affect your body, how it might affect your emotions and how it might affect your behavior. We always say you got to name it to tame it. You need to understand what it is and how it's affecting you in order to change your behavior and do things to feel better. Cognitive reframing is another skill that we'll discuss later, which involves thinking about thinking and trying to think in a more helpful way. Relaxation and emotion regulation, doing behaviors in your life to help yourself feel calmer, um, and modeling those behaviors for your child, your child engage in those behaviors when they are seeming anxious or upset, 
Um, healthy lifestyle and routines, which we know are really important. If we feel good in our body, we're more likely to feel good in our emotions and in our mind, as well as um, lastly, the most common and effective clinical component of treatment is exposure. And we're gonna talk about some ways to ensure that we are you de are doing exposures in our home with our children when they start to have an anxiety behavior that's getting in the way of their functioning. The first component that we're going to talk about with um, supporting your child with anxiety at home is education. The key to educating your child about anxiety is to provide information in a developmentally appropriate way to help them understand the experience of anxiety to help them learn the vocabulary of anxiety so that they have the words to describe the way that they are feeling, um, for them to understand that anxiety is normal, common, and that it does get better if we work through it together. So the question now is, how do I help educate my child about anxiety so that they can tame it themselves and recognize that it's happening? Um, this slide has some really great resources to do that. Younger children respond really well to children's books this slide has some great options for you. Um, in these stories, the focus for all of these children is that they were experiencing something they were very anxious about, and they get brave and face up to their fears and work through the thing that they're anxious about and find out that it's just not as scary as they thought it would be. And that really is the key to supporting children with anxiety is facing up to your fears, um, not letting that anxiety monster get bigger. And these stories do a great job of explaining that um, we also have some YouTube videos here for teens as well as younger kids that explain the experience of anxiety in my body and in my mind. There are some great websites here with resources for parents and kids for understanding anxiety and how it affects a person, as well as there are some awesome apps that include self-calming strategies and some education about what anxiety is and how it affects you. The real key here as a parent is that if you're noticing your child experiencing anxiety, Providing them with some education about what it is, how it feels, um, is how we start to identify that it's happening and that our child can do something to feel better or we can support our younger child with doing something to feel better. I wanna come back to the cognitive triangle that Jared explained earlier and start talking about what we can do to support our kids with anxiety in each part of the, in each corner of the triangle. So the first one we're gonna discuss is thoughts, thinking about thinking. Often kids experiencing anxiety and adults experiencing anxiety are engaged in what we call cognitive distortions, thinking that is way out of proportion with what's really going on with, with the situation. Um, one common way of engaging in a cognitive distortion is having a thought that's a catastrophe, catastrophizing. This is the worst thing that could happen. I never get what I want. This always happens to me. Other thinking traps include mind reading. I know she's judging me. I know they don't like me. Um, as well as fortune telling. I know what's going to happen in the future. I know I'll fail the test. I'm sure that this is going to go poorly. These types of thinking are really common when we're experiencing anxiety, but are also often untrue and definitely unhelpful. If we're thinking that everything's going to go poorly, it certainly isn't going to help us feel our best, and it often will impact our ability to behave or perform. And so starting to tackle this, these thoughts and change these thoughts is the process of cognitive reframing. Helping our kids to start picking apart their thinking and come up with more helpful and more true thoughts is the process of cognitive reframing. Some ways that we can do that are, um, let's take the example of having to give a public speech. If I have to give a public speech and I'm nervous about it, I might be thinking, I am the worst at this. I always clam up and struggle to get my words out. What if I go blank? Everyone in there is going to be judging me and thinking that I'm terrible about at this. If those are the types of thoughts I'm having, I'm likely to feel anxious and tense and nervous, and I'm likely to be more tense when I'm giving my speech, and I'm more likely to forget what I was going to say and clam up. So in order to, per to perform better, I need to try to think better. Ways to do that include, I could start asking myself some what if questions. What if it goes better than I thought? What if other, there are other potential ways it could go? And starting to introduce some idea that 
perhaps there are other outcomes than I was thinking when I was thinking it's definitely going to go horribly. Other things I could do are examine the evidence. I could write down on a piece of paper evidence that it's true. I'm the worst public speaker in the world. Well, I did give a really not great public speech a few months ago, and I just stumbled over my words. But you know what? I did fine on this other public speech I had to give. And I presented to my peers a few weeks ago, and that one went okay. Well, maybe the evidence shows that it's not my strength, but actually I've performed well in the past and I probably can again. The best friend test is another way to look at our thinking and determine whether it's helpful or true. If I think about, would my best friend tell me I'm the worst public speaker in the world and I, they know I'm gonna do terribly and everybody's gonna judge me? Probably not. My best friend would probably be would probably give me more grace and would probably be more supportive in their thinking. And if my best friend would, would talk to me that way, then why would I not talk to myself that way? A best friend would probably tell me, yeah, it's not your strength, but you did fine last week. You're going to do great. And if I listen to that voice and tell myself that thought, I'm more likely to perform my best. The key here is really that humor can be helpful and to try to help ourselves come up with more positive thinking. I always talk with students about, you know, if you know, for example, if Michael Phelps were standing on the blocks ready to do an Olympic race and he were telling himself, I know I'm going to fail, that just seems ridiculous, right? And so he's probably thinking more positive and more helpful things and cueing himself for things that he knows he needs to do to succeed rather than focusing on that he thinks he's going to do poorly. And really the key to this as a parent and teaching this as a parent is modeling it yourself. If you experience a setback in your day or in your life, or if there's something coming up that's causing anxiety for you, you could walk around the house feeling anxious and struggling with that emotion, or you could talk about it out loud and really model your experience. I'm really nervous about this thing I have for work or something that's coming up for me. And you know what? I'm thinking this, I'm thinking really catastrophic thoughts, but those aren't helping me very much. I'm gonna think about this differently. Here's a different way I could think about it. Doing that in front of our kids helps them to see the process of reframing their thoughts, examining the evidence, doing the best friend test, and hopefully coming up with a more helpful or true thought that they can move forward with. The next component to supporting your child who's experiencing anxiety at home is relaxation and emotion regulation. And on our cognitive triangle, this is the feelings part of the triangle. Um, doing relaxation exercises helps us to engage that parasympathetic nervous system in order to calm down the physiological experience of anxiety. One way to talk about anxiety or the level of anxiety that your child is experiencing is by using a fear thermometer or a subjective units of distress scale or SUDS. This one below is a one to 10 scale and it's pretty typically used in clinical settings. But I also encourage families to use it at home. It's a really good way to get a quick gauge on how your child is feeling. Because if your child is in this kind of six to 10 or seven to 10 range of experiencing anxiety, it's not likely that changing thinking is the best first step. If we're physiologically so elevated and upset that we're in this kind of six or seven to 10 range, it's likely that we need to do something to calm down and feel better first in order to then engage in some other strategies to feel less anxious. Here are some strategies for engaging that parasympathetic nervous system and helping our child to feel a lot calmer. Distraction is one. You can watch a video, shift, talk to something else, get up and change your environment, do something to sort of change the way of thinking and move on to something else. This is okay in the short term when your child is feeling really distressed in that six or seven to 10 range. Again, in the long term, we wanna face up to fears, but if we're so distressed that we can't really think straight, this is the time to do some distraction and calming and it's absolutely okay. Other tactics involve deep breathing, taking deep breaths in through the nose, expanding the belly and spending time breathing out as long and smooth as we can. Progressive muscle relaxation, which involves tensing the muscles and then releasing them sequentially and focusing on the sensations in our body to reduce the feeling of anxiety, as well as guided relaxation and visualization. The links on this page take you to good examples of all of those types of things that you could work through with your kids. 
Tackling the behavior corner of the cognitive triangle involves helping our kids to engage in healthy lifestyles and routines. Sleep is one that we're seeing is really problematic, especially for our teens right now. We have a lot of students staying up till four o'clock in the morning working on homework, getting up for class at 8 a.m., and then taking a three hour nap right after class. And I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen that in your kids. While they feel like that works for them, what it's causing is kids who are not getting enough sleep at night um, and for a long enough duration in one go, um, and kids who are feeling tired, kids who are having trouble paying attention and having trouble with memory. So if we can help our kids to engage in healthier sleep routines, they will feel better. Healthier sleep routines involve trying to get at least nine hours of sleep at night in one go, avoiding those naps that kind of reset our, our cyclical sleep schedules and having a consistent bedtime routine and a consistent bedtime. Now, I know these are a hard sell with teens, but if your kid's walking around feeling tired, it definitely will support them to try to help them come up with a, a reasonable sleep routine that they can try. Healthy eating, regular exercise, and, and helping your kids continue to engage in fun activities and things that bring them connection with their, with their peers and community are also really helpful ways to keep our behavior in line so that when anxiety producing things happen, we're ready to cope and ready to deal. The final component of supporting your child who's experiencing anxiety at home that we're going to talk about today is exposure. In a clinical setting, exposure is used to help the child or teen or even adult to take on and face up to their fears um, in a sequential and loving and careful way in order to sort of retrain their brain that the things that they fear are not as scary as they thought and they can make it through these things. We can integrate parts of exposure into our everyday lives at home. And I wanna give you an example of how this can be done. It's really easy as a parent to watch your child experience anxiety and distress and to want to take that distress away right away. Trust me, I know. Um, but when that anxiety starts to get in the way of our child's functioning, we can't avoid that thing anymore. And so I wanna tell you a little story about that. My young child, Sydney, was experiencing extreme anxiety over this white wolf that you see on your screen. It's like an animatronic wolf that they had at Home Depot. Our family was renovating part of our home last year and we had to go to Home Depot a lot and this wolf was terrifying her. And it got to the point where she was bringing it up at various times of the day when we weren't anywhere near Home Depot. Every time we got in the car, she was afraid that we might be going to Home Depot because we might see the white wolf. It started to really get in the way of our lives because we needed to be able to drive in the car and we needed to be able to go to Home Depot. We were renovating our house. So instead of telling our kid wolves don't exist and removing every stuffed dog toy in our house and putting our dog up for adoption that we have at home, we realized we have to tackle this fear and we have to start exposing her to it so that she eventually learns that it's not as scary as she thinks. So what we did was we started talking about the big white wolf at home and how we're gonna tackle this fear. We made it funny and talked about how it was so silly that it's not real. We talked about that it's just plastic and wires inside and that it's not a real wolf. We started to look at pictures of the wolf um, until we became comfortable with that. And we eventually worked up to going to Home Depot and seeing this wolf. Now, this is sort of a silly example because it's it's a you know d doll at Home Depot. But the reality is, is that if we had taken away those things that were causing anxiety for our child, we would be more likely to, to cause that anxiety to grow. And she'd be likely to then move that anxiety to other stimuli in her life, other things that are like wolves, other experiences that cause fear. She would learn from those experiences that she should avoid them and put them away. And instead, she learned to face up to her fear to this wolf, and now our family can go to Home Depot again like we need to be able to do. The key here is that, again, it's really easy to watch your child experience anxiety and to try to reduce it for them, to try to take away the stimulus that causes anxiety for them. And the reality is that that's not helpful in the long run. It helps your child feel better in the short term, but in the long run, our kids are learning that when we're anxious of something, we have to run away from it. And it can really affect long-term life consequences. So helping our kids to face up to fears by exposure in a kind, loving, and supportive way 
is how we help our kids eventually learn to work through all their fears that come up in their life so they can be courageous and live long and successful lives in the world by tackling things that make them anxious instead of running away from them. Elaine just showed us a great example of uh, uh, exposure therapy for a younger uh, child. Um, I'd like to talk about the next few slides about a, a older student and a specific example of, the, of a student I worked with um, at middle school level. And this is a student who had school refusal um, uh, due to significant social anxiety. Uh, she had a past history of being bullied and there was some history of, of family trauma. The student was in special education, which helped significantly uh, for a level of resources, and the student did not have any academic deficits. Uh, we used the, the SUDS or the fear thermometer that Lane showed earlier in this presentation as a way of determining how to move forward. And what you'll see there with the, the thermometers is that um, sometimes we started a six on a scale of one to 10, and oftentimes if the student responded afterwards with a two or less, then we would kind of go forward with the next step. And I'll show you kind of the next steps in the next slide. This is a sample exposure plan that's uh, done via a uh, fear ladder. And this is for the student with the significant uh, school refusal that I mentioned earlier. I did work on this plan with her and she had a, she was the driving force behind kind of creating this plan. I helped her kind of figure out what steps and where to order things as well. But for her, um, the basic baseline was to be able to stay in the office for two hours a day and without peer interaction and kind of work on school assignments. Uh, since school uh, avoidance was so significant and her anxiety was so high, we started off with just thinking about going to the classroom, teacher's classroom, that was about all she could do to start off with. Then eventually we got through that and we did walk into the hall uh, during uh, non-class or during class time to avoid students in the hall. Eventually we kind of walked near the classroom, into the classroom, and eventually started to stay in the classroom for shorter or for a short period of time and then increased the time over, over a period of, of several weeks. Um, this is just an example of what can be done in school settings uh, with kind of fear uh, ladders and exposure plans. Elaine is going to talk next about uh, another approach towards supporting kids, and that's uh, medications. Medication can also be a component of treating anxiety especially when strategies in therapy and at home have not been as effective as hoped and the child is still experiencing clinical levels of anxiety. The best outcomes in the research for treatment of clinical levels of anxiety involve medication as well as cognitive behavioral therapy together. Medications prescribed for anxiety are typically SSRIs and should be provided under close supervision of your physician or psychiatrist. From a school perspective, these are some ways that we can help uh, with students who have uh, anxiety. Uh, there are kind of basic services uh, such as clubs, organizations that can help with the social aspects and kind of help kids that way. We do have uh, tier one kind of SEL standards and lessons. Uh, we have uh, school-wide PBIS. Uh, right response is a way of helping uh, adults to work with kids. We have screening processes, variety of those. Um, obviously, each school has counselors that can provide um, brief kind of support as well. We also have at the high school uh, mental health services um, through our MHAT team, as well as our community mental health agencies. And then lastly, we for students who have more significant emotional challenges, we have um, our disability services, which would be a 504 plan and special education. This is a list of specific Bellevue uh, school district initiatives that we, uh, we're undertaking to support mental health and anxiety. Um, at the seventh grade and 10th grade level, uh, our health classes are doing mental health units. And in addition to that, um, they're also doing the signs of suicide protocol or, or lesson to help kids identify um, in others and in themselves uh, signs of suicide to and find ways of finding support. Uh, we also have these uh, social emotional learning standards and there's uh, common lessons uh, to do the secondary level for that. Um, at the elementary, we have the second step and uh, ruler uh, approaches as kind of our school-wide or district-wide approaches. Um, as I mentioned at the 
high school level, we do have the mental health assistance team, which is a group of professionals who uh, we use as a screening tool uh, called the BIMAS-2 to identify students um, who might have anxiety or depression. And then we offer them counseling, individual counseling support or actually group as well. And then lastly, um, many of our schools have also implemented uh, PBIS, which does have, it's not exactly aimed at, at uh, mental health, but it does um, help with some of the behaviors and, and we combine mental health with PBIS to uh, help support our students. On the next slide, I'm gonna go over some uh, other information, other initiatives such as UDL that um, our district is undertaking. Oftentimes our students with significant anxiety show challenges or problems with executive functioning. And I'll talk a little bit more about what executive functioning is in a few slides, but essentially it's a uh, brain functions that organize uh, work in organization and planning and task initiation, things like that. All of those things are very important in schoolwork. Um, and one approach that our district is taking, uh, and it's a big uh, initiative within our teaching and learning department, which is our curriculum developers in particular, is uh, Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. UDL essentially is a kind of approach towards looking at the curriculum and kind of making lessons and schoolwork um, more accessible uh, to everyone and being able to allow, make sure that they're understood by everyone as well. And really the goal is to kind of maximize learning and level the playing field for all students. The way of differentiating it and differentiating instruction in a way that's very natural and um, flows easily for all students. Um, it provides kind of general learning opportunities for, for each student. What you'll see down at the bottom there, the graphic is the kind of different areas of the brain that UDL um, engages. And I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about how UDL works. In teaching, it's really important as an instructor to make sure that we are using strategies and approaches that engage the student in learning, um, that we kind of use analogies and metaphors and, and uh, examples that kind of engage the students past knowledge and learning. Um, that's really important for them to be able to understand new, new concepts. And then as a part of teaching and learning, we also want to make sure that we're, we're reaching the students and the students are able to understand and be able to express what they've heard and what they've learned. And really, UDL kind of goes into those three main areas. The first one is representation, which is how the information is presented. And there's multiple ways of presenting information um, that is can be very helpful. And some students prefer visual information, some may prefer auditory information, um, but universal design can look for learning can provide multiple means of representations uh, for students um, that have those needs. In addition, there's multiple means of action or expression, which essentially means how students show their knowledge and through, through action or expression in some form or another. And it um, provides uh, different ways of communication and involves a lot of executive functionings. A specific example of that might be uh, rather than writing a paper uh, to express uh, or to show knowledge of a certain history moment, it might be the, the student uh, creates a picture or a graphic uh, novel or uh, draws something or does a PowerPoint presentation. Um, the writing itself is not the most important aspect of it. It's the knowledge and the information that they get. So if there's multiple means of expression, this does not penalize students who have more challenges with writing or have an emotional block around writing. And then lastly, um, it means uh, there's, it provides multiple means of engagement. Some students, if you to, were to provide them with a history lesson, they may not be very engaged in that history lesson. And so if you provide ways of context, providing context for that student to use areas of interest of their own, that can be very helpful for engaging them into the, uh, into the assignment and to the work. why do I bring up UDL with anxiety? Um, really the biggest reason is that school tasks and school environment are major triggers for students with anxiety and for students for anxiety in general. Um, it can be a large factor, anxiety can be a large factor in task initiation or being able to start a task. And what UDL can do is kind of help lower brain load. Um, sometimes kids who are 
in uh, fight or flight, their ability to think clearly is lower. And so if we can reduce the cognitive load or the brain load, the brain work, um, then we can help kids learn a little quicker and easier and reduce that anxiety, hopefully. Um, multiple means of representation, you know, as I mentioned earlier, really ties into students' prior knowledge. That's really important um, when we look at teaching is uh, being able to engage the information that the student already knows to be able to kind of connect ideas uh, together. And the other part that's really important is that uh, multiple means of action expression allows for students who are anxious to express the content knowledge in a way that does not trigger anxiety. So for example, um, you know, as I mentioned in the previous one, the PowerPoint or something like that, but student may choose to write something versus do an oral report or vice versa. It depends on kind of what it is and what the student's anxiety is. Um, it also, I mean, multiple means of engagement also allows for kids to interact with topics of personal interest and um, meet the, to meet the requirements of the activity. As I mentioned in a previous slide, students with anxiety sometimes have executive functioning skills, either because of the anxiety itself, the amygdala overload that it causes, and or the um, association of a learning disability or some other kind of just general ADHD or executive functioning challenges. And executive functioning is a kind of a mental process often involved the frontal lobe of the brain. And it um, involves skills that control most of what we do on a daily basis. Um, it helps us plan and respond to the tasks, challenge and opportunities that we face. Uh, it really involves activating or extreme monitoring, evaluating and adapting to different strategies to accomplish different tasks. It really helps us to kind of navigate the world and be able to think about the past and the present and the future as well. And as I said, um, students with anxiety often show challenges with executive functioning in the moment. With the previous slide, I just wanted to give you a sense of what uh, executive functioning is and how it's important in, in students with anxiety. And now I want to kind of give you some strategies that you could use at home, uh, some basic, very basic strategies when working with students, your student that might have anxiety challenges around schoolwork in particular, because that tends to be a very significant one for a lot of families, especially now. Um, the first one, I'll go through each of these in uh, the next few slides, but the first one's behavioral momentum. The next is task completion, time estimation. It's a specific strategy. Think out loud strategies, the I do, we do, you do strategy, and then task analyses and checklists. And I'll, I'll describe those in the next few slides. Behavioral momentum is one of my favorite tools. Um, it's really kind of a magical <laughs> tool. Um, basically describe, it's kind of like a warm up exercise or kind of if you're, you know, ever go for exercising or run or walk or something like that, stretching before it, or maybe just doing a short walk before going running. It's kind of that that getting into the, the headspace before doing a, a challenging activity, essentially. And the idea is that uh, the more technical term is presenting a series of high probability instructional commands. So giving a student's work to do that they're highly likely to do before a low probability activity or command. Um, and what happens is, is that if because they've done this warm up, they're more likely to engage in the, the low probability activity. For example, there was a study by uh, Voss and Lee uh, not too long ago, well, 10 years ago, so it is a while ago, it doesn't feel like that long ago. But anyway, what they did was they pre presented, uh, they took fifth graders with uh, emotional behavioral challenges and they had them read a uh, fifth grade paragraph and they timed how long it took for the students to begin that task and how long it took to complete. And then what they did is after they did that, they took a similar paragraph same reading, reading level, and they introduced a third grade reading paragraph immediately before that paragraph, the fifth grade one. And what they found was that the time it took, or the latency, the time it took to initiate, start the reading of the fifth grade paragraph decreased significantly. They also found that the, um, they read the uh, paragraph faster and the students increased their words, uh, the words read correctly minute as well. So essentially what this is, is, is that if you have at home, your student is having challenges doing something, pick something easy for them to start off with. It kind of gets them into a frame mindset uh, to do the work. Um, the way I liken it is to like having a, a writing assignment 
sometimes it takes me about 15 minutes before I'm doing a writing task before I get really into it. And so this is kind of an approach that can be done at home. This is an activity or a strategy that I've actually used with my, my kids at home when they feel anxious about an assignment. And oftentimes, um, kids who have trouble starting an assignment feel a overwhelming sense of dread about the assignment because they think it's going to take forever. And more often than not, that's a not a true statement. It's a cognitive distortion. And so this is an activity that was done by uh, Peg Dawson and Richard Guar that uh, basically asked the student, you know, how long it would, they think it would take to complete the assignment. And then when they start, uh, they take down that time and then they, they know when they ended and then look at the amount of time it actually took. Um, and what you'll find is that it actually takes a lot less time than they predict. And so you can use that to show the student or to your child that, you know, part of the challenge is just starting it. And so sometimes just jumping into it is really helpful. And this task combined with the behavioral momentum can help get kids kind of start a task and get more um, initiated to do better initiation and kind of maintain task persistence. This is a strategy that we use in schools a lot that I think could be useful at home. It's the think out loud strategies. And essentially for a student who's having trouble uh, starting or beginning a task, um, sometimes what I'll do in working with a student is to kind of model what I think that they're thinking. And so we'll start with a hard task and I will kind of approach this, the task how I think the student might by kind of role playing. And what I will do is I will kind of model my thoughts and feelings or talk about my thoughts and feelings out loud to the student. Um, I might say this task is way too hard. I'm never going to understand this. I'm stupid. I can't do this, you know, whatever it is. And then what you might do when should do actually not might do is model the appropriate way uh, the appropriate coping strategies um, for that child. So this may be hard, but you know what? I can do this. What do I need to look at to do this? Um, I can ask for help. Uh, you know, this is really important to me. My parents really want me to do this, whatever kind of thoughts or, or um, ideas that you think that your child would engage with. And then essentially what you do is you do the task until completion. And so you might model some, some errors or challenges and model going back to the work, um, the notes or something like that as well that can help students. The I do, we do, you do strategy is another approach that teachers use all the time and something that you've probably done at home, uh, maybe didn't know what it was called, but it's a very common approach. And essentially it is demonstrating the, the task for the student or your child um, and you model the appropriate behavior. You can use the think out louds that we just talked about. Um, then you do it, you show all the steps, whatever it is, if it's a writing assignment or if it's a math problem or a reading assignment, something like that. Then you can work with the student and say, you know, give certain parts to the student. So if it's a math assignment, you might uh, have the student do the first two steps and then finish the problem. Or you might kind of rotate back and forth between that. Um, and then eventually you slowly release control to the student. So, you know, often works well if there's an assignment with multiple problems or questions where you might do the first one, two or three questions or, or items yourself, do the next few together, and then you have the student do the last few on their own. Um, again, that helps them kind of uh, by your modeling, not only how to do it, but you're also modeling the appropriate kind of emotional approach towards it. This last strategy sounds complex, uh, tax task analysis and, and using checklists. It's actually fairly easy to do at home in particular. And essentially it's the idea is that breaking a large multi-step kind of process into small concrete tasks, essentially. Um, and what you'll notice there is like uh, the afternoon, you know, for Sam's afternoon checklist there is it might be to come once you come home or once you're off offline uh, for school is to have a snack, do homework, have some free time. You can set time frames in there, set the dinner table, have dinner, play a game, you know, all of those things and the student can check that off. What happens with checklists is that sometimes students have what we call anticipatory anxiety. They don't know what's happening next. 
Um, and often students with autism have anticipatory anxiety because it, it's very unclear what's happening. But so even students with generalized anxiety or other types of challenges also have anticipatory anxiety. And so what it does is it provides them with comfort and a routine to kind of go through. Um, uh, that is, so they know exactly what's coming and there aren't any kind of surprises as well. It also provides a way of prioritizing activities like um, you know, having, having homework, you know, do homework. Number two is putting that as a kind of a priority before free time and playing a game um, as well. Um, and also there's a sense of, of accomplishment when a student can cross off a list. So another approach might be if the student has schoolwork to do uh, to help the, the student with the schoolwork by noting on a checklist what items need to be done, putting a little box there and then checking those off. So we just took a little detour uh, about things that you can do at home to help your, your student. Uh, but I also wanted to go back to what we can do at schools and what kind of school supports are there. And obviously the first one there is a 504 plan, uh, which is a uh, students with uh, anxiety sometimes qualify as having a disability. And there are students who have disabilities um, that don't need specially designed instruction, uh, but might need accommodations in particular. And that's where a 504 plan can be helpful. And students with anxiety um, often qualify for a 504 plan and can be very helpful. One of the more extreme um, interventions that we have is our RISE program. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but is, this is for students with significant school refusal behavior. Um, uh, you can contact uh, your school counselor if you have questions about RISE, what that is, but it is a resource that's out there for more extreme situations. For some students with significant anxiety, uh, the 504 plan is not enough, and so they might require special education. That's kind of one service that we can provide through the district for students with anxiety. Um, this involves accommodations and modifications and specially designed instruction. And the SDI, or specially designed instruction, often uh, focuses in around motion regulation strategies. How do we help students recognize that they have anxiety and then providing them with strategies to help cope with the anxiety? Those strategies might look like uh, what we talked about earlier with uh, relaxation techniques, it might be cognitive reframing and things like that. Sometimes we also recognize the student may just need a break um, and teaching them to utilize a break in appropriate time is one approach towards supporting that student. Um, oftentimes we have them go back and do the work if, if possible, but they may need a break in that moment. Other students, um, just teaching them how to ask for help. They get so wound up or uh, upset that it's hard for them to ask for help or they have some social anxiety around that. So we, we help them to ask for help, we teach them how to ask for help. And then other students, we do set goals in attending classes, uh, specific classes or school in general. Some of the services that we do provide um, often go through what we call our social skills classes, which might, you know, they're called social skills classes, but they do involve kind of emotion regulation support, but also some of our kids have some uh, social anxiety associated with uh, their generalized anxiety if they have that as well. So we can provide them with uh, proper ways of interacting with other students and kind of helping them uh, with that as well. For some students, um, they need additional one-on-one -on -one support, and that's where a social worker might come in and provide additional services on a weekly basis. And then lastly, um, some students require even more wrap around support and more uh, more support during the day. And that's where our cascade program comes in. And that often in, involves a significant process of evaluations and determining kind of what has been done in the past to, to see if a student would qualify for that program as well. So that's kind of what's available through special education. Uh, we're gonna hand it back to Lane. She's gonna a little bit talk a little bit more about community supports. Community health agencies are often a great place to start if your family is seeking counseling or support for yourself or your child. Many of the community agencies located in Bellevue are listed on this slide and the links will be available to you in the slideshow later. These services provided by these agencies are often um, provided at free or low cost based on your family's ability to pay and health insurance status. 
Private agencies are another great way to seek counseling services if you're noticing anxiety in your child. The best way to access private agencies is usually to see your pediatrician, let them know what you're experiencing and ask for their recommendation for who to see and where to go. Your pediatrician can usually make recommendations for providers who use health insurance um, that are in your network. Some key things for families that we suggest is anytime you're seeking therapy to give it a few sessions to see if the counselor is a good fit. Sometimes kids can be resistant at first, but they really buy in um, once they've tried it a few times. Also focus on finding a provider that uses evidence-based practices such as cognitive behavioral therapy. And the key component that should be involved in any therapy to tackle anxiety is exposure. If your therapist should have a plan for how to support your child in facing up to fears. The most effective therapy often includes parent and family involvement. And so when you're looking at therapists, also be looking for that. To summarize what we've talked about today, we just want you to remember that anxiety problems are very common in kids and teens. If this is what you are experiencing at home, you are not alone. And with home supports, school supports, therapy and medications, kids get better. The last thing we want you to remember is the only way out is through. Avoiding things that make us anxious only tend to let the anxiety monster grow. Facing up, up to it um, and working through anxiety is really how we improve in the long term. Yeah, and these are just uh, some resources there at the end that will be in the uh, uh, handout for that. So that's our presentation. Um, we should probably go into Q&A at this point. I know that was a lot of information. Um, and, and I thank you for hanging in there. Um, tons of information. Um, I hope that you kind of heard that that, that last slide uh, that Lane did really sums up kind of how we respond is that it's about exposure. It's about love and kindness to your kids and recognizing that sometimes when they're being a, a, a real pill, it's actually they're being anxious. They're very afraid. And so just kind of uh, lovingly kind of give them some, some respect, holding them uh, helping them to stand up to the anxiety. So we didn't have a lot of questions posted in the chat um, while we were talking, but you are welcome parents to use the chat now to ask a question. We're happy to kind of hang out for a bit and answer anything that's kind of coming up for you. Or unmute and just ask it aloud. Yeah. Thank you guys. Can I go first? Yes, please. <laughs> um, so I've always kind of struggled with finding a good uh, middle ground with um, letting her have her space when she's having a little bit of anxiety or stress with homework, for example, trying to fit it all in, letting her have her space, but also driving the message home that she still needs to give it a good effort and that she still needs to try. So what do you guys suggest or what do you see with that? Are we talking mostly about um, assignments and getting to school work? Correct. It's usually about she's overwhelmed with the amount of stuff or she's realizing that she's waited too long and is running out of time and now she's having to deal with the pressure of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jared, I don't you want to take that one? You want me to? <laughs> um, either way. I mean, if you feel like you've got it, um, you can take it. If, if not, I can. I mean, what I can what I can say is um, I hear you. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, what I want parents to know is you're, I mean, what you're, what you're voicing is really, really common right now, especially in at home learning. Um, kids are feeling, you know, less motivated than ever, right? They're missing a lot of the typical kind of social aspects of school that are motivating. Um, and so you're not alone, right? In, in being at home and going, but just get started on it. Come on, you know, um, and so a lot of the approaches that Jared talked about in this presentation can be, you know, really, really helpful to try to help our kids get motivated. But I hear you when we've got a teenager who's like, get out of my business, I can handle it. Um, it's really, it's really challenging. Right. And so she gives me the, um, the comment. It doesn't have to be perfect. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. I still have three hours or whatever, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard. You want to be logical and give her space, but. How do you how do you encourage them to try a little harder? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I can speak as a, as a parent of a high school student and uh, eighth grader. Um, my oldest um, is in a, a program where there's a lot of, you know, she has AP classes, and so there's just tons and tons of information. And what I've found in watching her um, do this is that um, it's really hard for, she's, she's a bright kid, but she has a real hard time staying focused in class um, because it's not as engaging. And I think this is clearly a product of the pandemic and online learning. And so what will happen is, is that she will miss some key points of instruction or things to do. And so it's easy to kind of put that off. Um, you know, she's she's thankfully she's we've worked with her for years about getting work done and all that. And so she's able to eventually do it, but it causes her immense level of stress. I, you know, I, I guess my my recommendation is I think that this year is an abnormality, uh, clearly, and this is where love and compassion kind of comes in. I think that um, providing support where you can and doing some monitoring and helping her with the, the self-monitoring in particular and asking some subtle questions um, about like, um, you know, one of the things my, my youngest daughter, we had we had troubles last year getting her engaged and this year she's doing it and part of it is we, we kind of actually uh this was hard to do but we pulled back quite a bit and we set uh some expectations we talked about how she can engage with the teachers uh to get information in um and i you know without kind of specifically talking to you more about your daughter it's hard to know kind of where the challenges specifically lie Mm -hmm. um, and that may be a conversation that you can have with a school counselor or, you know, one or individual teachers if she's having more troubles in certain areas. But I also found that really backing off did help in the mm -hmm. end. Um, being loving and still holding her accountable. Um, and that's, I know that's a contradiction in terms. It's really hard <laughs> to, <laughs> to say that. But, it, you know, it's something that I think we're all facing right now. And, and you know, my, my take, the way I've kind of said to my, my kids is really, I don't expect you to get perfect grades. Um, I want you to do your best and um, and try to to learn as much as you can. Um, you know, that's that's kind of the message that I'm giving. And I also will be, you know, hey, I'm here to help. Mm -hmm. And if my child is failing, that's where, you know, that's that's where drawing a line as a parent is like, this is not an option. Failure is not an option here. And I am going to have some, you know, we're going to have some hard conversations about it. You know, this is that part where I think Lane was talking about um, not shying away from difficult conversations when the anxiety is getting in the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a parent, it's hard to judge when to uh, when to have that hard conversation and when to let things go a little bit. Um, yeah. And I, I often encourage parents to, and, and I support this process often as a counselor, right? I work with the student and I work with the parent kind of separately and then I help them come together. But it can be done at home without that middleman um, to really try to sit down together. And, you know, if, you've, if, you're, if we're talking about a middle or high school student who's really kind of coming into their own and trying to be very independent, um, to sort of come to the table like you would if you're an employee at work was not performing as well as you'd hoped, right? You, you know, you sit down and say, here are kind of our expectations and you try to really, really be a listener to and give your child lots of space to kind of say what's going on for them and try to find some middle ground. Like these are the things that are kind of non-negotiable that we need from you, but we also understand that you need your space and that we can't be asking you about your grades every five minutes. So like I worked with a family last year who you know, the parents agreed to kind of only check the grades in Synergy once a week and only be checking in with the child about it and kind of doing those, you know, monitoring once a week. And but the kid made some agreements, too, that they would be engaging in the work during the week and that they, you know, wouldn't be sleeping in the middle of the day. And that, you know, if those, you know, if they were falling, if, you know, if, and they had an agreement like, OK, if the grades, you know, are, you know, if we have more than two grades below a C at our weekly check, that means parents are gonna have to do more stepping in. But they kind of came to it like a business meeting, right? And it really can help to sort of say, we wanna hear your concerns, we're ready to listen, we wanna give you lots of space, but we also expect these things of you because we're your parents and that's our job. And so, 
it's hard. It's a hard conversation to have. And sometimes having a counselor is kind of a middle person to, to, you know, to help those things go, you know, calmly and smoothly can be helpful, but it can be done as a family too. It just really takes, um, I know as a parent, right, it's hard, but it really takes like <laughs> listening, you know, like, you know, give really, really give them the space, hold back your, your interest in kind of telling them, but you need to, but right. Like really giving them the space to speak and yeah. share what's going on for them can be helpful. It's when I was saying, you know, but I think that's, that's a great approach lane. And, and when I said sometimes giving them space, that doesn't mean not holding them accountable in the sense of like, and I think, you know, using the business like approach is a great way of doing that. Yeah, like having some agreements. I'm not going to come in your room and bug you when you're trying, you know, when you're doing work time. But on the same note, I do have to check in on some kind of regular basis. So let's yeah. come up with an agreement together about what that's going to look like. The one thing I want to stress with that is the the often the pushing away of the parent is a stress, anxious, anxiety <laughs> response. Um, I don't want to talk about this because this causes me anxiety. And so um, how you approach that could certainly, you know, affect how and when you approach that. Like if, you know, if, if your daughter is high on the on the anxiety scale or has had a, a rough day or something like that, you know, our defenses are often up. And so sometimes catching them, you know, I find for me with my daughter, um, when I want to have hard conversations and, you know, she now knows when, when this occurs, so she avoids me. But no, uh, we go for a walk. Um, and that usually um, she's much more open to harder discussions, uh, things like that, because she's more engaged and it's, it's more like kind of a, uh, a mutual shared activity. So Thank other so thoughts? Or questions? No, but yeah. we hear Thank you. I'm so grateful. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm so grateful that um, you guys are there and, and to know that we do have the school to kind of help us out with the middle ground, because I know that there's times where the parent is not as credible as somebody that comes from their school and yes. that, you know. It, too. you know mom you don't know mom you're not the teacher that type of thing so i'm so grateful that you guys are helping our kids as well so thanks yeah we so are nodding along because we hear you yeah they're <laughs> like you don't know what my teacher wants for me you don't know what it's <laughs> like <laughs> yeah that's perfect thank you guys yes <laughs> yes other thoughts or questions or comments I saw there was one comment about UDL. Um, mm -hmm. um, it was mentioned, some folks might not know what that means, but it's universal design for learning. It's kind of the what, why, and how of learning. And um, there are a lot of things going on with the district with UDL, but we have also thought about doing a parent presentation okay. and one Great. person mentioned it and two people gave it a thumbs up. So um, I'll go ahead and bring that to the folks who are in charge of that. Great. Are there any other Great questions thing. this evening? If not, um, you will be receiving an email, probably not until tomorrow or the next day, but it'll have the um, PDF of this presentation and there will be a link to the recording. Um, okay, we just to, just to clarify, sorry, this is Jen. Um, the <laughs> The recorded session probably won't be ready till next week because we have to run it through our communications department. Um, but I, I can send out the materials tomorrow and then the recorded session can be sent through a separate email next week and it'll be coming from our um, our district email. It's the special ed family resource at bsd405.org. So just be on the lookout for that. So if you registered for the session, you will get those. Okay, and we thank you all so very much. This was great. Thank you, Lane, and thank you, Jared. Thank you for the time. Appreciate it.